Okay, uh, morning everyone. I actually, um, <laughs> this morning I wasn't quite sure. I just want to make sure that it's at Yost building. So I went to the Buddhist Fellowship website just to make sure that, you know, I, I know the talk is on. And something <laughs> you didn't know was so funny, I have to share with you. In case you have not looked at the website, it says it was an introduction of the talk, which you know is about accepting imperfections. And then it says something about me. It says, mm, for someone who has devoted his life to, I don't know, balancing numbers, sta da 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 di da. You know, I'm an accounting guy, right? They, his talk is on imperfections, which is true. You know, accountants have to balance books, right? So it's about the perfection, you know, in balancing books. But I have to confess, you know, I don't balance my books. I don't balance my bank account. I don't do a bank reconciliation, okay? So... I'm not a very typical accountant. Um, I just want you to be aware that I'm not sure if this is going to be a very Buddhist talk. Okay, so um, just come with an open mind, all right? I'm just sharing some of my explorations. Okay, so if you disagree, by all means. But I think this topic... Um, I don't know, may trigger some people, may not, I don't know. So I'm just going to start. It's, it's sort of like a paradox. And this is a paradox I've been exploring too. You know, like in uh, Buddhism or some parts of Buddhism or some people will talk about, oh, you know what? You know, the Buddha is the perfected one, right? The awakened one. And then we all aspire to be Buddhas. Who is the perfected one? So this is again about pursuing perfections, right? And then, you know, if you talk about the parameters, they talk about the six, what, what do you call that? The six what? Perfections, right? So what am I here talking about? Accepting imperfections then. So... Um, you could, I'm going to meander through and hopefully, you know, you, we can participate uh, in some dialogue. But are there perfections in this world? Certainly there are, right? If you think about it. Externally, you know, there's famine. There's war, right? There is violence. There are tragedies, right? You know about the Tianjin explosion. I was in Tianjin just like two weeks ago. There are children starving. There is rape. You read about the ISIS and how they, the sex traits. So there, there are imperfections in the world, in the external world we live in. You want to accept them? You want to change them? Internally, if you think about your own internal world, I think there are a lot of imperfections too, right? I'm not sure if you are happy. So there's an internal state that's not that perfect, right? In your own internal world or in your own, I mean, in your own life, some of us come from broken families. Maybe our marriages, our relationships aren't that great, not that perfect, right? Our children are not growing up the way we want them to be. Our academic work, our <laughs> academic, you know, if you're schooling, it may not, the grades may not be as good as, it, as they are. So what are you going to do about it? These are imperfections. You want to accept them or you want to seek the perfection? So, it is a paradox. So what do you do with perfections? Well, so maybe we can try to look at the Buddha's teachings to see what the Buddha teaches us about perfections and imperfections. And I think you can look no further than perhaps the first noble truth. What is the first noble truth? What? That there is suffering. There is disease. Maybe another way of putting it is to say that there are imperfections. Right? 
And now they may go into a spin and say, oh, okay, maybe that's what the Buddha says. The Buddha says there are imperfections as a way to get out of it. So therefore, we should seek the perfection. Maybe that's what your mind is spinning and telling you to, to accept. Right? There are imperfections. That's the first noble truth. Right? And then the third noble truth is really that, you know, there's a, a, sta a state where there's no suffering. And the fourth noble truth is that there is a way to get out of this. So maybe the conclusion is that, yeah, there is that perfection and the way to get there. But I want to ask you to go back to the first noble truth, that there is suffering. So what the first noble truth is telling us is that there are imperfections. And actually, when you talk about the imperfections, the sufferings, the essence, as I understand it, okay, of the first noble truth is for us to accept that there are sufferings. The acceptance of the sufferings, the acceptance of the imperfections itself is extremely healing. In a sense, I'm not even... I'm, Obviously, you, you need to go to the other truths. They're all interrelated. But the first truth itself is particularly healing. Why is it healing? It is healing because by knowing that this is what life is. By knowing that this is what it is and there's no way you can change it as in, in terms of the existence of all these things, that there is death, there is sickness, that there are people you don't like and who will keep popping up in your, of, of all places, your office maybe, maybe sometimes in your own home, that there are loved ones who will surely pass on or be separated from you, that there are things that you will never get. Buddha says there are such things and the point is if you know that there are such things, knowing that this is what, this is the this is part and parcel. This is the whole package that comes with the gift called life. If you know that, that itself, as I said, actually is already your route to greater happiness. Because that's what life is. And if you choose to refuse it, if you choose to reject it, you are rejecting life as it is. So, you know, so if you look at the first noble truth, it is actually telling us a little bit about acceptance. So when some of the things happen to us, we may not choose for them to happen. Well, that's another story altogether, whether we choose or not choose to have them. But we may not like it for these things to happen. But if you really appreciate the first noble truth, you know that this is part of the package called life. And when you accept it, the mind stops fighting it and you may, can you may find greater peace. So you understand that? So this is the first noble truth and that itself is talking about acceptance. Is there anything else in the Buddha's teachings that tell us about Perfections, imperfections, and what to do with them? Well, I think there are. So, you could think about the Buddha's uh, life. So, you know, earlier on, the Buddha, after he left the palace, he started practicing what? What practice was he engaged in? You remember? What practice was he engaged in? Hello? Hello? Life of the Buddha. I think the youths should know, right? What, what happened? After he shaved his head, what did he do? His hair, not shave his head, shave his hair. Sorry, what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, what, what did he do? He practiced ascetism, right? So he lived the life of a yogi and he practiced ascetism. And if you read, you know, like, uh, what he did, he went on to great extremes. Right, like surviving on a grain every day, you know, in fact, not eating much, correct, and practicing, practicing the harshest of practices. In a sense, if you look at what the Buddha did, it was a case of trying to find 
perfectionism in his practice. That means the more harsh, the harsher the practice, maybe the better it is. That's an, an example of seeking perfection or perfectionism in a sense in that practice. And you know that at some point in time, his body couldn't take it any longer. You know, he felt that he was, his body about, was about to give way. And then you remember, he remembered that, um, that the incident about the, what? the cord, right? Not too hard, the string, the string instrument. Not too tight, not too loose. Because the instrument doesn't play well when it's too tight, too taut, nor when it is too loose. And you go for the middle way. Yeah? So again, that is an example where the Buddha is saying that, look, this middle path is the path. And if, you, if I want to slant it towards this argument or this premise about imperfections and accepting it, that is also one way of looking at it, okay? So, so far so good. But I want to uh, go a little uh, deeper into this arg idea about perfectionism. By the way, how many of you feel that you have this streak of perfectionism in yourself? Anyone here? Feel that you have this perfectionist Inside you? No one? Really? Okay, oh, that's good. One. Okay, then I'm the second one. Okay. Did no one else? Okay. Um, how many of you have heard voices? Okay, it's not that type of voice, uh, but it's like every time you do something, and then it says, oh, you know, you could do better. Oh, no, you shouldn't have done that. Oh, my gosh, why, why do you do that? Have you had that voice in you before? You had that? Okay. Well, then welcome to the club. Because this is what we sometimes call, you know, like the inner critic. That's the inner critic. What does the inner critic want you to do? To be what? to be ever better and better and better and better. All right. So I'm going to say something controversial. It's my own observation of myself, uh, so I shouldn't talk about others, that particularly when you start becoming a little bit more religious, more spiritual, then the inner critic actually becomes louder, a little bit louder, okay? Not a bad thing, uh, all right? Not a bad thing. It's my own you know, exploration I'm sharing with you now, so you can disagree. But it sounds it becomes a little louder, number one. And then number two, when you come to a place like a temple or the Buddhist fellowship, then you feel like, my gosh, you know, I have to be prim and proper too. Do you have that feeling? No? Like today, this morning, I had that. I was starting, okay, what should I dress in? I said, oh, maybe I should dress in white, you know, because I'm coming to the Buddhist fellowship. Then I said, ah. So why? Why would I want to dress in white? Because maybe people expect me to dress in white. I have to look very holy, you know. <laughs> so what I'm trying to say is that I don't know whether it's in you. I see that in me sometimes, and I'm just observing it which is part of the practice I'm talking about that I was trying to engage you in at the start, which is, you know, I'm not asking you to enter into concentration. I'm asking you just to be aware, aware of whatever comes up in your mind. And so, in us, in us, there's this part of us that just wants to look good, that just wants to look ideal, you know? So we may want to be the perfect Buddhist or the perfected Buddhist. Or you want to be the perfect mother, okay? Or, you know, whatever it is, the perfect lover, I don't know what it is that you want to be. Maybe there's a button that pushes you, but there's one part of us that was, wants to be that perfected person, which is not bad at all, okay? We all want to be liberated, so that's an aspiration, but there's one part that, that part itself can be the part that gives you a loss of grief in this life. In so much that this voice, that inner critic, 
that, that, that wants to be so much better is actually out to help us. It is, as I said, you know, oftentimes pushed to the extreme that it creates a lot of misery for us. And I tell you, that happens in at least two ways. This is from own experience. Eh? Firstly, in your mind, in our mind, you know, there's this ideal state that you have to live up to. And so you beat yourself up if you don't live up to that. And then, that's not really being kind to yourself in a sense. Because then you start beating yourself up. You know, why, you know, I said, no telling lies. I was like, oops, something just came out of my mouth and then you start beating yourself up again and again. In a sense, that's good because that's monitoring. But carry to the extreme is not good. Okay, because in a sense, the big danger, the big danger in all this extremism is that after a while, you get very tired of being a Buddhist. It's like, oh my gosh, last time before I was a Buddhist, I was so f f nice and happy. Now it's like, my gosh, you know, I feel I'm under so much stress and strain. Uh, if you don't find joy in what you're doing, if you don't give yourself space to make some mistakes, but you keep yourself you know, pacing at that perfected pitch, sooner or later you're going to lose steam. So, you know, you just have to give yourself a little space, okay? But for many of us, for some of us, at least for myself, I've observed that sometimes I don't give myself that space. And that, in the past, has been a lot of grief, okay? Like, if I can't be, I need to give the perfect speech. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll feel bad, okay? It's like, okay, maybe... But if I tell myself that I'm here just to share and then you can disagree, maybe I feel a little better, which is my premise here. You're not looking at the saints now. It's not, I'm just exploring now. But I'm just sharing with you and then we can explore together. So th this is one part that gives you grief. But I think there's a second part which I feel is a little bit, bit more ominous and a little bit more dangerous. And this second part is the part that that comes from this aspiration to be perfect, but in the process of trying to be perfect, you forgot that you are not perfected yet. And then you may now pretend to be perfected. Oh, that's the, the, the dangerous part. And I'll give you a story, okay? I was trying to dig it up, but I couldn't remember. It was someone's autobiography or it's a story, you know, about those mime artists or clowns, they actually paint their faces, right? And it's always a bright smile on them. I'm not sure whether it's a story or it's an autobiography, but the point was the following, okay? For a mime artist or a clown, you have to appear happy all the time in your professional life. And you have that painted smile and you always want to make people happy. And when you start wearing that for a long while and having to do that for a long while, from a positive perspective, yeah, maybe you truly become happy. But, from, but at least in that instance, and I remember it was a very famous mime artist, what happens is that you've forgotten who you really are. You've forgotten that maybe you've lost, oh, not that you've forgotten, you've just lost connection with yourself that maybe truly inside there's some parts of you that's really unhappy and you might have to do something about it and all you have is that painted smile and then this is what we call a mask right you basically are wearing a mask and a mask that you've forgotten to take off and you've now assumed that the mask is yourself now that is a true danger and we may be wearing a mask you know, in what we do, and we, you know, like in, in Sichuan, they put the pian lian, no? they keep changing the mask, you know, in your work, you wear a mask, in your home, you wear a mask, you start changing masks, and when you start losing connection with your true feelings, with truly what makes you tick, and what, what really goes on in your mind, in your heart, and all you have is that, that mask, then unfortunately, we may be losing our humanity. And not only that, you lose your authenticity. And if you are not able, if we are unable to actually know what is going on inside, there's really very little you can do to change. 
Do you know what I'm saying? If you want to improve, you, if you want to change for the better, first you have to identify the problem. Unfortunately, when you start wearing a mask, you think that you aren't that person that the mask is telling you. And you don't think you have a problem, but you do have a problem. And the mask is just, you know, hiding it. That is an issue. So I'll ask another question now. So how, how many of us here feel that we have a mask on? One. You just think for yourself, do you have a mask on? A mask? Okay, I'll give you some examples of masks, then you answer the question again, okay? You can have the mask of peace. It's like, wow, you're boiling inside, you know? And then it's like, oh, you can smile and say, oh, yeah, it's fine. How are you today? Oh, I'm great. You do that? I don't know. That is a mask. You carry on for too well, a while, you, you, you lose track of what's going on. That's a mask. Okay? There's a mask of uh, control. That means like, I'm in control, no? It's like my whole world inside is just topsy-turvy. It's like I appear very competent. I'm just like rushing around doing things. But I'm in control. I think I'm in control. But actually, it's like I've just lost control in the sense that I'm not even sure what's going on inside. I'm just going on clockwork. Maybe that the, the mask of control or the mask of busyness is that I occupy myself with lots of things, you know? So that I don't care, so I don't have to think about what's going on. I've been, I'm in control. I'm in control of what's going on externally. I'm actually not in control of, of what's going on inside. That's a mass of control. And of course, there's a mass of spirituality, okay? Which is like, oh my gosh, I have to look super holy today, right? You know, or in particular settings, I have to look very holy, super, super holy. And. Maybe we are not. That's a, another mask. There are tons of masks. I mean, you can, you really have, um, you, if you look at yourself, there, there may be masks that can be uncovered. So I ask again, how many of you feel that you have a mask now? Okay. All right. For those who you don't have, great, good for you. Okay. But, uh, I ask that you explore a little bit. I mean, um, from a developmental psychology perspective, let me tell you some of the origins of the mask, and then we can understand it a little better. From developmental psychology, it talks about the child. Okay. And the child is really like pretty helpless. Right? It's actually very dependent. Very dependent on the love, the support of the parents. So for example now, and it's true, parents are busy and, it, and not all parents are actually tuned in to the way of taking care of a child. So the child may have needs. Uh, needs as, simp as simple as just wanting to be fed. It's needs as simple as needing to be hugged. And then when the child is deprived or doesn't get all this, and it depends on the child, right? Children have different thresholds and it gets denied some of this. Then it decides, okay, that, oh, there are two ways to survive. One way is to get horribly hurt and just die in depression. The other way is to actually tell itself that, okay, I don't need this. Okay, I'm good. So that's the, the, the evolution, the start of that, 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 uh, that state, that so-called uh, projected state that it needs to be. Or I tell you another way, okay? Children are horribly intelligent. So there are certain things that, you know, and that's the way we educate our children, right? They got to be good, okay? Cannot talk when adults are around, you know? You must do this, you must do that. And then when you do this, what happens? You get rewarded, right? With candies and stuff like that, right? You get toys. If you don't, you get punished. From a recognized perspective, that's education. But 
one possible outcome is that the child also learns that in order to get the rewards of love, to get the rewards of material rewards from the parents, I got to be this way. Right? I got to be this way in order to get the rewards. And again, I got to be good. I got to keep quiet. You know, I got to be this, I got to be that. Again, this is the evolution of the idealized state, that projected state uh, that the child needs to be. And so it has this, uh, this um, the seeds start when the, the, the being is a child. And so there's a projected state that you know, tells itself when it gets deprived that, you know, I told you the first example, when a child doesn't get what it wants, after a while, it can really get very miserable or it can tell itself, look, you know, I'm shutting this part down. I don't need this part because this part, this craving for the love, this craving for the hug is giving me a lot of misery. I shut that point down. So, you shut it down. I don't need that. I don't need that any longer. I think I don't need that longer. I'm not going to be hurt any longer. Or, you know, as an adult, maybe there's some trauma in terms of some emotional relationship. You get terribly, terribly hurt. After that, you tell yourself, look, enough, you know, I'm not going to open my heart any longer because if I open, it's gonna, the dagger is going to come in. I don't need that any longer. So I'm strong. I have no need for this any longer. So, and so, the story and the show goes on. It's a show because maybe deep inside, the wound has not been healed. There's still that need. But you've shut it down. And you think you're strong. You think you don't need it. That's the idealized state. And may, that's the mask too. You know, I'll give you another example of a mask, okay? Another mask is like, a mass of like, oh, I'm so loving, you know, it's like, oh, gosh, my gosh, I'm so loving, everybody in front of me is, feels like I'm so loving, but that is a mask, because love is, in this, is actually unconditional, but for this mask, it is actually a mask of neediness, the person really, really needs something, in order to, and in order to get that, it pleases, it pleases everyone, and tries to be loving for every, but really, really in exchange for love. You know, so the Buddha talks about, you know, it's a tough thing. Eh? The Buddha talks about not telling lies, right? That's the, the fourth precept. If you really want to talk about it, and it's, I think it is actually about trying to evolve. It is trying, you know, I repeat again, we want to improve. We want to be liberated. But in order to do that, you actually need to be honest with yourself to find which part of you is actually which actually has a problem. You need to be authentic about it. Now if you start putting masks on and stuff like that, it's hard, you know. It is really hard to know. And it see it goes against this thing about awareness. So really this is about awareness, this is about being authentic. And this is about maybe, you know, we are projecting, doing certain projections on ourselves and living a lie. I don't know, okay? You have to know for yourself. And then see that, oh, you know, am I, am I pretending or am I being authentic? And then you will know what is it that you need to change or improve on. If you know that you're not in, in not, yeah, you haven't reached that state. You can actually put more effort to actually work on it. But if you think you're already there, then, then there's nothing else to work on. So, yeah, I was telling you about the origin of the idealized state, the origin of that projected image that you want, and the origin of a mask. The mask that we're talking about is actually designed to protect us. When you put on a mask, then people, if you're, see, if, if in a society, people will approve of you if certain, in certain, if you behave in a particular way, you put on a mask because that's where people won't complain about you. In the office, you have a mask, right? 
At home, maybe you have a mask because if you put that mask on, look, no one is going to bother you. So it's evolutionary in the sense that it's meant to protect us. But at the same time, it can hurt us. It can also um, prevent us from developing ourselves spiritually, emotionally. I'll give you an example, uh, a little bit about how do you know? How do you know that you have a mask on? i tell you something, okay? If someone says something, and then it's like, oh my gosh, you feel like, whoa, that hurts. Then they say, oh, okay. Then maybe that is an indication that there's something that you need to protect. Now, of course, you can say it's your ego. True. I mean, globally, you can say that anything that hurts your ego hurts, which is true. But it says, hey, how come a Buddhist like that one? Oh, then you say, huh, why? Why? Then you feel like, wow, that hurts. Then, watch out. Are you having that mass of spirituality? If someone says that, hey, Buddhists cannot like that, then you feel like, oh, wow. It's like, I feel like, hmm. I told like myself this morning, oh, I am succumbed to that also. I know, should I wear white? What for? Right? But the <laughs> thing that says, hey, maybe you should wear white right, to, to look more spiritual. Okay, then I know. I have in part inside me that spiritual projection. I have that. You know, um, I have other things. I'm, I'm not sure you want to hear all about my, my, my dirty laundry, okay? So, but I can, I'm willing to share if it helps you. But I have the whole set of dirty laundry that I'm discovering for myself, okay? Um, that shows that, hey, look, there's a lot of things going on, Okay? Uh, any questions at this point? Well, I pause to collect my thoughts. Okay. All right. So, I guess the big question is, what do you do with it now, now that you've discovered, suppose you discover that you have these projections that you have to live with. Okay. Hopefully, if you think you have it, then it's good. Good as in, okay, it's good as in, Obviously, maybe not some of you have not dealt that. So, yeah, having that is not a good thing. But assuming you have it, it's good to discover it. So, you know, what, what would you be able to do about it? Right? Well, as I said, the first thing about mask, about all these projections, is to be aware that you have it. Now, the second thing that you've got to do is really, one well, that you've found it is to actually unmask it. Now, what do you mean by unmask? When you feel that you have a mask, so for example, I'll give you the example, okay, about um, spirituality, or about if I give a talk, I know I need to be appreciated. Then I start looking at myself, hey, hello, you know, it's internal conversation, okay? I'm not listening, I'm not hearing voices, I'm just internal conversation. What is it what is the button that's being pushed? See, be, be beneath every mask, there's something else. Beneath the mask of love, you know, wow. Well, what's, what's, what's beneath it? I told you it's insecurity. Actually, beneath every mask is an insecurity. It's something insecure. There's something insecure that you're trying to hide because you cannot show people what you are. And so you put on the mask. So insecurity is there. But as you dig deeper, you can actually uncover deeper emotions, deeper feelings, deeper psychological states, you know, that's preventing yourself from being authentic to yourself. Now, I'm not telling you that after this, like everybody do a confession, uh, okay? You can just do your own internal confession to yourself and find out like, okay, what is it? What is it that is... Of course, we say there's no self. But what is it that is part of this identity called me now? Okay? What is it that makes the so-called me? Because if you understand the components, it's easier to treat it. Okay? So, yeah, I said, look beneath the mask and find out what is it beneath it? What lies beneath? There, there's definitely there are things beneath it. Okay? So if you lock, talk about the mask of control, like I'm totally, totally in control of things, again, it's insecurity below, okay? There's probably obviously some fear below, 
all right? And obviously, for persons like that who actually occupy themselves, you know, with busyness and with things, you know, as I said, there's a, this inability to actually look at your own weakness. You need strength. It's, it's a sign of someone who's actually crying for help, someone who's really very weak inside. So, when you peel the mask, you can look inside. Now, then, of course, I told you about the perfectionist that will come in, right? The perfectionist will come in and batter you. Oh my gosh, what a weakling you are. Okay, so, Buddha also talks about compassion. And this is a big point that I'd like to point out. Before, okay, before we can talk about compassion to others, before we want to talk about that, hello, please be compassionate to yourself. Really. Why? Because otherwise, whatever you manifest as compassion may be quite fake. Really. If you cannot even like, be kind to yourself, and sometimes it's hard to be kind to yourself because of this perfectionist mode. If you cannot be kind to yourself, it's really a little fake to talk about being kind to others. Because what is it that motivates you to be kind to others? Well, maybe it's actually food, okay, to make you feel better about yourself. So the origin of that compassion is still out of that neediness. It is not out of concern about others, but it's really about that neediness that wants you to do something in order to make you feel good about yourself. You've got to solve that neediness first, right? Basically, because then that's where your true compassion comes in. Now, I'm going to pause for a while because otherwise, after, after that, everybody stops donating to Buddhist fellowship. But it's not bad to actually do something uh, charitable. Gives you merits. I'm asking you to actually uh, have better returns, okay, from your donations, from a kind deeds. Clean up, clean clean the mess inside first and then whatever you do externally would have more merits you still have merits but as long as you have that you know that non-authenticity inside you know it is so called contaminated so yes peel it open look at it and look at it with compassion and say, oh wow, I hear you, I see that. And you know what, actually, this is about Vipassana. When you start looking at it with compassion and with acceptance, accepting your own imperfections, that monster actually stops or reduces in its energy. It really does. You might have heard of this um, story. It's a Buddhist story about this king who actually went away. He went away for a while, okay, for an expedition or just to visit. Whatever it was, he was out of the kingdom and he left his pa um, palace in the care of his ministers. Now, while he is away, okay, a monster a little demon came and paid a visit. Okay, and this demon is visible. Okay, visible. Okay, this is a seven month. Okay, <laughs> now, this thing. it's actually Ulambana, uh, by the way. It's not <laughs> but uh, tradition has it that is da da da. Okay, but anyway, it's a visible demon and came knocking and says he wants to come in. Now, the obviously demons means they don't look good. Okay. And the ministers and the soldiers will look at it and say, like, my gosh, you know, what do you want to do inside the palace? And then it started beating it up, throwing spears at it, throwing arrows at it. And then the demon got more angry. And then when it got more angry, it got bigger. Oh, it got bigger, it looks more scary, right? So more arrows, more spears. Then it got bigger and bigger and bigger. Until it became like really like, you know, bigger than a hawk, bigger than... King Kong, whatever it is, okay. And then the king came back. And the king came back, and the king is an enlightened being, and he says, oh my gosh, 
what's going on? He saw that monster getting angry and angry, and he says, oh, my poor thing. How, I said, I'm so sorry my, my uh, ministers treated you so badly. Please, you know, you're welcome to come into the palace. And then with these words of kindness, the demon got smaller and smaller and smaller. So this is the story, actually, in, uh, it's a Buddhist story. But it is um, applicable to so-called, our so-called demons inside ourselves. It's not really a demon, huh? but whatever it is you know, that wants us to put on a mask, whatever inside us that wants us to project ourselves as certain things, there's this insecurity, there's something that we are, uh, want to hide. If you look at it with compassion and tell yourself that, look, we are all humans. Humans are imperfect. I am an imperfect human. No doubt I'm an imperfect human. I'm still trying to be better, but look, I accept myself for what I am now. Now, this acceptance is extremely healing. I don't know whether it's making sense to you. You really have to actually find that part of you that's actually feeling insecure or having the need to be perfect. You, you actually need to f- find that part and then open it up and then b- have that compassion and tell yourself it is actually perfectly fine the way you are to have that acceptance. You know, for example, maybe you don't look pretty, maybe you don't look handsome, maybe you're as skinny as I am, you know, you don't have big muscles. Hey, look, Maybe you can do something about it, but if you cannot do anything about it, then first noble truth, there is suffering. Accept it. If you cannot change it, you just have to accept it. Accept your imperfections, but also acknowledge your ability to change within limits. I think then, at this point, you know, you will be more at peace and you can actually pursue your whatever spiritual path a little, with a little bit more joy. And you can actually, perhaps more importantly, be a better human. I've sort of um, come to a tentative conclusion that you can of course p- pursue your spiritual path, which we should. But I feel that actually as part of the pro- process of being a better spiritual person, I think we also got to learn to be a better human being. And part of being a human being is actually, you know, applying the Buddhism inside to this aspect. is to be able to know yourself and then evolve to be... Uh, to, to evolve, basically to evolve, be more accepting. If you can accept yourself, you can accept others. If you cannot accept yourself, I, I don't, I'm, I'm having trouble to see how you can be accepting of others. You know, when certain things like really irk you, okay, you know that when wh- whoever it is that actually irks you, there's a part of you actually that is resisting that, that may have that characteristic and that you're blocking out. You know why? In a sense, once you can accept that we are humans, we have certain traits, And if you talk about compassion, you can understand that everybody would ha- come with certain flaws, different buttons that push them, push them, different flaws, as I said. You know, if you can accept that, you can accept yourself, and then you can really manifest your compassion. If there are certain things you feel that, look, you really cannot accept, then when that person manifests that straight, I'm not sure how you can manifest your compassion. Okay, so, yeah. Um, I don't know, I got a feeling that some of us are listening, some of us are in the denial, but never mind, okay. <laughs> I, I just want to add a little bit, uh, because I don't want this message to go out and say, oh, gosh, let's write, let's like throw the puja books away and you know, throw our aspirations away. This thing about accepting ourselves as imperfected humans does not mean that you never want to change yourself. I mean, these are actually two different things, two subtly different things, and I just want to make that clear before we stop today. (coughs) 
it is one thing to say that you know we really do have certain flaws and certain flaws that we want to hide it's another thing to say that okay then let's live with it and then live with it for the rest of our lives that's a different thing you can accept yourself but you can also make an aspiration to be better but one thing I do want to emphasize is that the acceptance of yourself is not conditional on whatever happens to you in the future. Now this one, you have to underline it, triple underline it. Because some of us actually have this idea that, you know, subtly, intrinsically, or subconsciously, that, look, you know, I want to be this, I want to be that. And maybe subconsciously, there's this message inside us that, I'm going to be happy with myself only if I get to that state. I'm only going to be happy with myself, you know, you know, if I become more muscular, if you know, I become more handsome, if I become richer. It's all conditional. Unfortunately, you know, then, remember the Buddhist teaching about present moment, you are living in the future because everything is conditional on something that may never happen. So, as much as we say that we can change and improve, set as an aspiration, put your efforts to it, but be glad and be accepting of your life. Be glad and accepting of whatever you have, whatever you are endowed with now. And it's actually not difficult to accept that once you again pull in this idea about karma, you are what you are because of your karma. Your karma is what it is right now. Right? So if you can accept that, then you can actually say, okay, this is what I am. So maybe I'm uh, prone towards anger. Maybe because of whatever karma, I'm not as rich as someone else. Fine, okay? If you really can believe what the Buddha says, this is what I am now, I'm going to accept it. Because you have a choice. You can either accept it and be happy about it and be not happy maybe. Accept it, you know, and have comfort in that, or you can reject it. I repeat again, you know what was going to happen if you reject what you are right now? If you reject what's happening to you right now, and you reject it as in, right, you know, I really am not accepting this. I say it slowly, okay? Because when you do that, you are rejecting your life. You are rejecting your life because your life is what you are right now. I repeat also that it doesn't mean that you cannot change and improve. You can, that's an aspiration. But if you change, you want to change and improve, but you make it such that your acceptance of life, your acceptance of yourself is conditional on whatever's going to happen, you are always on a treadmill and you're trying always to catch the, you know, the dog that tries to catch his tail because it's always one step ahead. You're going to live a life where you're never happy because... You, you always have something else better to do, something else to achieve. You know, part of my job is to grade, right? Great papers, give marks. You do not want a life uh, where your life is really about grading yourself all the time. How much do I have in my bank account? Great. 1 to 10, 1 to 0 to 100. You know, how, mo how much more spiritual am I? Zero to 100. You spend your life grading yourself on that. It's completely, you know, who are you competing with now? And I, I'm going to end now because I don't know how much. And I'm supposed to end at 12.15, 12.30. Oh. If you start, if you grade yourself all the time, who is your biggest competitor? This, you know, the biggest competitor is yourself. Your inner critic is trying to make you better. In that case, what's the benchmark? It's always the the benchmark is always yourself in the future. That's your inner critic. Your perfectionist self is again about someone you want to be in the future. Look, you're again comparing. We used to talk about comparing with others. Well, what I'm trying to tell you now is that sometimes your so-called worst enemy is yourself. You're trying to grade yourself continually and it's going to cause you a lot of misery. Okay, so I'm going to end now, um, just summarize a little bit because we can meander too much. We talk about imperfections. We have certain ideals in life. The Buddha is an ideal for us. The liberated state is an ideal for us. 
but what I'm trying to say is that do not get caught up in this idealism in terms of like measuring yourself all the time against what the ideal is and having your happiness dependent on your achieving that, hap that ideal state. And the ideal state for some of us may not even to be to be in a liberated state. It may be to make money, you know, to have a happy family. Because the moment you do that, you are living in the future. And so the whole point about accepting our imperfections really is that be aware of what we are now and then be accepting of it, but not losing your aspiration. And perhaps the second point which I feel at this moment is probably more important for some of us is that in this pursuit of the perfection, in whatever aspect of our life, have we at this point in time lost track of ourselves? Have we at some point in time started putting on a mask? And you've got to be aware. And I... I'm in no position, okay, to tell you. Some people who are more discerning can actually say that you're very fake. When some people say you're fake, then maybe that's also a signal. Because some people, it's actually quite true. If you're not authentic, people can see through too. But it's best you see through yourself and see whether or not you do have that mask. And then at some point, have that compassion to look inside and see what's hiding behind the mask. Okay, so I'm done. Um, I don't know how much time there is for questions, but if there are time for questions, I'm happy to take questions. Maybe we can have a time for a few questions for those who you would like to ask questions. Just raise your hands. No? Okay, I ask question. Uh, Professor Tan, uh, how would you suggest um, if you have a friends who are very not accepting about his imperfections and keep rejecting about it? La, and it's difficult when you kind of like approach in a way that you are giving them advice to accept yourself as what you are and all that Be because the negative negativity that blocks that mm. yeah so so yeah w well for people who have that i think it's a little hard to talk to because basically um anything you say could actually be a big button that promotes or that, that triggers them in terms of their so-called imperfection. One thing is that to actually, to, we could do, is to actually, and they have to be in some uh, quiet state of mind, is to actually start talking about their own strengths. And it's actually very helpful. A lot of times, in terms of this sick, uh, quest for perfections, perfectionism, we actually start looking only at our weaknesses. And I think it's sometimes good to reflect on our strengths. So start looking down at the strengths and what they are. That's one thing. And the second thing is, again, you need to have the mind receptive. We always have a choice. You can always remain in your negative state about how imperfect you are and how you want to get a better state, maybe. But you also have a choice to just be accepting of what you are right now and then be a bit more at peace. Because when you reject, you're going to cause yourself more unhappiness. They really have to see that when they start doing that, they have this negative uh, ambience about them. And they're going to make themselves more unhappy. So, it is that insight that they have a choice, and the happiness is in their own hands. That they have a choice to be happy or unhappy. They can always reject life all the time. Is that what they want to do? I've recently also started like imagining uh, my life as it goes on, you know, and something that your friend can do too. Suppose it goes on, keeps, you imagine that this year this is going to happen and next year it's going to happen and then it rolls on until the, the day you die. If nothing happens, that's what's going to happen and you can see that you're going to be miserable for the rest of your life. Now, what I've been doing is actually like imagining myself in my job, in, in my life, daily life, as like 
Oh, okay, I can see myself. Today is like, this year has passed very quickly for me. I can say, my gosh, it's almost a year done. The next year, my gosh, it's another year, another year. And I can see myself like, if I continue doing what I'm doing, am I going to be, um, is this what I want with my life? I, I keep, I just roll forward. And that has actually been very helpful because I don't want to be lying in my death and, and look backwards. I'd rather just roll forward and say that like, assuming this is going to happen, what's going to happen and am I going to be like, satisfied with my life this way or do I want a change, for example? You know? So something like that too would help. But these people like that need a lot of support and that's the key point. They need support from friends and family to actually... Um, reinforce that there are certain positive attributes about them. The support and the love is the one that will break them out of this trance. It's a, it's, they are in a spell. Okay? And I think that love and support will help too. Questions? Okay, if there is no more questions, maybe let us uh, thank Professor Tan for the very inspiring and insightful sharing. Let us say three sadhu. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu.